Okay, so here's where we left off yesterday. We left off talking about this example, right? I wanted you to find all of the holes and vertical asymptotes, and let's go with the additional step of using that information to make a sketch of the graph, okay? So what did we find here? We, we did some work, we factored this, and somebody remind us why we had a hole at x equals two. Okay, because x equals two is a zero top and bottom. Good. So then why was there a vertical asymptote at negative two? Only a zero on the bottom. Okay. And then why is there a zero at negative four? Because it's a zero on top only, which is just zero, right? Good. So then we got something like this. Now, but if we, we know we have an asymptote at negative two, there's one other additional step we could do here. We could say, okay, we want to know what are the infinite limits as we approach to from either side. So how would I set up, if I want to know what the left asymptotic behavior is going to be, what limit am I going to set up? That's it. Okay, good. The limit of this guy, right? And I'm okay canceling those out when I take my limit, right? Everybody agree? They don't affect the shape of the curve when I cancel like factors. All it does is it fills in a hole. Sure, that would be yeah, yeah, plus, plus two. two. Plus two, you're right. Okay, all we're doing is filling in that hole. Everybody agree? There's no reason for us to complicate things by having those factors in there. Okay? So as x approaches two from the left, what's that going to give me? On top, I'm going to get. Is it negative two? Or, uh, is it? Is it two? Oh, you're right. It's negative two. You're right. Approaching negative two from the right. What am I going to get on top? Would that be from, the left? from the left. You're right. Gosh. One more time. <laughs> <laughs> the limit of my function is I approach negative two from the negative or left direction. Good. So what what number do I get on top? Yeah, uh, it's just two, isn't it, right? Does it really matter? I mean, technically, we could say that it's two plus, but who cares? It's two, right? It's, it's macroscopic. It's not something tiny. It's a big number, relatively speaking. It's just two. Okay, but on the bottom, that's where we got to be careful because it approaches zero, but it's not zero. What is it? Be careful with this. It's something, you, you, okay, right, how come? Because it's approaching from the left of negative two mm -hmm. to make it negative two point whatever. Negative two point something yeah. plus two is going to give you a leftover negative point something, right? Everybody agree? So it's a zero minus. So what flavor of infinity do we get from the left? Negative. I get a positive divided by a negative gives me a negative sign, and zero on the bottom explodes, right? So from the left side, it's doing something like maybe that. Everybody agree? Okay. What about from the right side? As I approach negative 2 from the right, I still get the 2 on the top, but the bottom now is going to be, this time it's 0 minus, because I'm doing something like negative 1.99999 plus 2. Gives me a little... 0 plus. 0 plus. Zero plus. Zero plus. Zero, oh, plus. Gosh. <laughs> 0 plus. Right? Because I get something like negative 1.99999 plus positive 2 gives me a little leftover positiveness. Right? Okay? Positivity? Anyway, positive infinity. So then it looks something like this, doesn't it? Our function's going to go, we got a hole there, but then it's going to continue on up like that. Right? So we got a pretty good sketch. Later on in the class, we will learn how to introduce a horizontal asymptote that will make our sketch even tighter. Okay? So right now, though, that's pretty good. Okay? Next issue trig functions. 
let's let's find let's find all of the vertical asymptotes for the function tangent x. Okay, you know what a tangent curve looks like, so you can already answer the question. But how could we? You know, really, a lot of times. I don't even bother remembering what anything but sine and cosine functions look like specifically. I know the basic look, but I'll always just kind of figure this out based on deconstructing a tangent into a sine over a cosine. And now you will too after this. You don't have to waste those brain cells memorizing stuff. Memorizing stuff is weak sauce. It doesn't, it doesn't stay with you. Don't memorize stuff. Instead, you want to just you want, you want to know the powerful concepts that underlie how do you get the answer. And those never go away. So how am I going to do this? Change the sine, cosine. Change the sine and cosine. Perfect. So we're going to rewrite this as sine x over cosine x. So if we want to find any discontinuities in the function, where are they going to show up? Where, where what's going to happen though? How do we, what do we always have in common? Holes or asymptotes both involve what? Zeros where? In the bottom, right? Make sense? Zeros in the bottom. So this is going to be discontinuous wherever cosine x equals zero, right? Everybody agree? So we've got to find the question, we've got to answer the question then, where does cosine x equal zero? Okay, but it's not just one and negative one. There are an infinite number of answers, right? If we draw the unit circle, cosine is the x-coordinate, right? So where is cosine x on the unit circle going to equal zero? Would you agree it's going to be there is where, where the x-coordinate is zero? And there. Right? Oh, that's pretty infinite, though, because the infinite circle is a circle. You could go around it as many laps as you want to, right? Forward and backwards. Well, yeah, let's, let's think about that. So we want to know, how do, we, how do we say all of those overlapping points? What's that going to be? So this one is, so let's make a list here to start with, and then we'll come up with a much better way of doing this. Let's make a list of some values of x where this thing is going to blow up because we're going to have zeros on the bottom. Could we also agree, before we even start on this, that the zeros of sine x are going to be different than the zeros of cosine x? They're never going to overlap, are they? Agree? So we're not going to get any holes on this function. Every zero of cosine x is going to give us what? Every zero of cosine x is unique to cosine x. It's not going to overlap with the zero of sine x. So we're going to get asymptotes for all those? Everybody agree? OK. So the question is then, how do we name all those? Okay, we've got to find a, a mechanism for naming all those. Let's come up with a list. What are, so we start, here's zero, what's that? Pi over 2, what's that? Three. If I go around a lap plus that, what is it? What if I go backwards? What's that? Go backwards further. Right? So what do we have there? How would you describe those? Those are all products that fit a pattern of pi halves. <clears throat> They're all some kind of multiple of pi halves, aren't they? How could you describe all the coefficients of pi halves there? Though? All the numbers are going to be multiplied by pi halves. We've got negative 3, negative 1, positive 1, positive 3, positive 5. What are those? What's the pattern? Well, I'm not worried about the pi part. I'm worried about the coefficients. Every one of those is a number times pi halves, isn't it? Look at the numbers, though. What are the, those are multiples of pi halves, but 
what multiples? What are the what are the numbers that are being multiplied by pi halves? It's ne ah, it's negative three, it's negative one, it's positive one, it's positive three, it's positive five. Yeah, it's just the set of all odds, isn't it? Everybody agree? So we could say then that the vertical asymptotes are going to occur at all of the odd multiples of pi halves, right? Any odd number times pi halves. It's an infinite set of, of, of odd numbers. So then the, the trick becomes, how do we turn that from an English statement into a mathematical statement? How can we somehow write the set of all odd numbers? When we do this, we've got to start with some defined known set and, and turn that into the set of odd numbers. So think about the sets we have to work with. What are the sets of real numbers that you remember talking about way back when? Throw them out there. What if I just include, what's the set of one, starting at one, one, two, three, four, et cetera? We never used them, but what did we call that, you remember? Don't remember? It's not a big deal, it's, you never use it. It's the natural numbers, or the counting numbers. What if you add zero to that? Zero, one, two, three, four, what are those? No, integers are bigger. That's whole numbers, right? Remember this stuff? Now, what if we do the positive whole numbers and the negative whole numbers combined? What are those? Integers, right? Those are the hash marks on a number line. They go forever, both directions, positive and negative, right? So then we've got, we can get beyond that, we can get into rational numbers. Well, that's not going to work, is it? Rational numbers are weird. Rational numbers could be any kind of bizarre fraction. Real numbers includes everything, even non-rational numbers, irrational numbers. Right? So we get pi and square roots of two and weird things like that that as decimals never repeat, never terminate. Those are too complicated, but which one of those probably seems pretty good to us to start with? Integers, right? Doesn't that seem like a good start if we take the set of all integers and then we could maybe just tweak that set of integers in such a way that we could, ex we could only produce even or odd integers? Uh, uh, the coefficient. Okay, okay, but now let's find it. Let's find an algorithm for kicking those out, all of the odd integers. So let's just start off by saying, let's let n equal any integer, right? So n represents the set of integers, okay? n, a better way of writing that. So n is an element of the set of integers, j, okay? That's our math way of saying it. So n, n is all of it. How could I, it's always easiest to maybe start with even. How could I write the set of all even integers if n represents the set of all integers? So 2 already starts off as an even integer, right? Okay, that one's taken care of. But the odd ones, how can I take any odd integer and make it even? Multiply by 2, right? That's it. So if I want the set of even integers, that's defined like this, isn't it? That's going to be the set, that's just going to be 2n, right? It works for all of them. What if n is 0? 2 times 0 is 0. That's even. What if n is 1? 2 times 1 is 2. That works. What if n started off even? 2 times an even number is still even, right? 2 times any integer is guaranteed to be even, isn't it? Right? Okay, so if that's how we define the set of evens, how might we define the set of odds? Do what? Say it again. Just k. Okay, but that's not going to work because if I just have n, that includes like 0, 1, 2, 3, 4. So that includes some evens and some odds. Can it not be uh, the equal sign slash 0? Can it not be so? 2n plus 1? Well, I mean, we, we can't. Ah, 2n plus 1. 2n plus 1, right? So that's does that make sense? Because if these are the evens, aren't the odds just one more or one less than the set of evens? So we could either take your pick. You could either call it 2n plus 1 or 2n minus 1. It makes no difference. Either way, we're going to get the set of all odds, aren't we? Let's use plus one. So that's going to be the set of all odds then, right? 
So now, is there a tricky way that we could define all of those odd multiples of pi halves? We know that the values of x that are going to cause vertical asymptotes, so we could use the not equal sign if we want to. These are the values of x that must be excluded, that are excluded from our domain, because this is where we're going to get asymptotes, are going to be what? We just want to somehow say a set of odd integers times pi halves, right? How do I say the set of odd integers? 2n plus 1 or 2n minus 1, whatever you want to say, right? Okay, so it's just going to be x is not equal to 2n plus 1 times, whoops, pi over 2, let's say. Make sense? That works. Works. Pick a value of n. 1. 1. 2 times 1 is 2 plus 1 is 3. 3 halves pi. 11. 2 times 11 is 22 plus 1 is 23 halves pi. That's there if I keep going, right? I'm going to get 23 halves pi. It's going to be one of our, that's going to be on one of our laps, that's going to put us at one of those two points, right? Everybody get it? Okay. So that's the domain of tangent x. These are all of the infinite places where we get vertical asymptotes. Right? Make sense? So what if, what if we do something very much like that? Let's say that we're going to limit it this time, though, to say we're going to limit it on this domain. Say we're going to say we want to go on the domain from uh, the open interval from negative 2 pi to positive pi. How could we figure out what values those are? I mean, we could just add them up. But what if it was a really big interval, right? Couldn't we just define a value of n, right? We could do this one manually because there aren't that many. There's only four total. But what if we were going from negative 200 pi to positive 200 pi? Let's do that. asymptotes there. It's going to be all the odd multiples, right, of pi halves. So it's going to be all of the values of 2n plus 1 over 2 pi, right, that fit this. How could I find the endpoints? You see what I'm saying? We, we could just say, that's the set, but we're only going to take the integers where n is going to be pinched between what values? We're going to have to fill in the blanks and say that's our set where n is defined as being greater than or equal to some integer and less than or equal to some other integer. How can we find out what the lower integer is going to be, the left integer is going to be? What do you think? Did you get the button on the ground? That's a good question. I've never asked that before. New territory. Would it just be 100 pi? Well, I mean, maybe, but I don't care about what the answer is. I care about how do we get the answer. Plug in. Well, not for n. Why don't I just do this? Wouldn't you agree that we're going to get some answer like it's not going to be it's going to be an odd multiple of pi, right? But it's going to have a pi halves. But what is what is that relative to negative two hundred pi? If I go backwards around the circle a hundred times, I'm going to be essentially at almost negative two hundred pi, just offset by a little bit, right? Everybody agree? You know, if you think unit circle wise. If I'm going backwards around the unit circle to negative 200, that, that's like 
2 pi is 1 revolution, so that's 100 revolutions, isn't it, right? So I'm going to go 100 revolutions, but I can't go beyond that because that's out of my domain. I'd have to back off just a little bit, right? It's going to be close to that, though, isn't it? Everybody agree? Okay. In other words, it's going to be how many multiples, odd multiples of pi? Well, there would have been 1, there would have been 2, there would have been 3, there would have been 4. I've got to keep adding those up as I move around the circle negative 100 times, right? If I went all the way to negative 100 times, how many multiples is that going to be? This is going to have been some integer multiple of pi halves at that last stopping point before I get to negative 200 pi. Everybody agree? If I went a little further, that would be 201. Or that, excuse me, that would be not 200. I don't want to get that, don't forget that number. Uh, whatever this multiple of pi halves was, if I went one additional multiple of pi halves, I went too far, right? So if I stopped there, am I going to get back an integer value for n? It's not, is it? Because I went 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, et cetera, et cetera, up to some final answer. Let's just say hypothetically that it's, uh, let's say hypothetically that it's, how about uh, 399, hypothetically. If I went one more, it'd be 400, right? See what I'm saying? So if I stopped right there, it'd be 399.5. You get it? But that's not an integer. So I would have had to back off to 399. Is there a mathematical process that could have told us maybe how many multiples of pi halves took us to my left boundary? Well, couldn't I just couldn't I just set this do some algebra? Couldn't I just set minus two hundred equal to that? You see what I'm getting at? That's gonna if we set those equal to each other and solve for n, what am I really saying? I'm just saying, what's the value of n? How many multiples of pi halves gave us negative 200? It's not going to be an integer. I'm going to get a decimal. But once I get that decimal, what do I do to it? Let's just solve it and see. You tell me the answer. Let's see what we get when we do that. So 2n plus 1 over 2 equals negative 200. What do I do to solve for n? Multiply it by 2. Multiply it by 2. So 2n plus 1 equals negative 400, right? Uh, subtract 1. 2n equals negative 401, right? Divided by 2. And I get n equals negative 401 halves. Wasn't that the same thing as negative 200.5? See what I'm saying? Okay, so if I went backwards, I started at zero and I went backwards and I went through uh, that many multiples of pi halves, see what I'm getting at? Then how many could I actually keep? 200. Right? See what I'm getting at? That's a pretty complicated. I mean, but you see how we could do that? You're not going to get any questions like that. But you get the idea? How you could, even on some massive interval, you could just see, well, how many of these, how, you know, how many of these odd multiples of pi halves fit into that? So it's just telling you how many work last and just capture that interval. Yeah. So from zero back to that value, I'm going to have 200 vertical asymptotes. And I'd have 200 going forward, too. I'd have a total of 400 vertical asymptotes there. Right? That's how many fit in that picture. Okay. Make sense? Okay. All right. So... That was way, of, I mean, that's just extra stuff. Don't, don't worry about that. It's kind of a fun topic to discuss. Okay, so what about something like this? 
Last issue, and then we're done. We're done with everything that I can think of for our next, our first test. Okay. So. Yeah, you'll get retools. That's why I'm a big believer in retools. Uh, so what about this one? Let's find all the same stuff as before. Let's find all the holes and vertical asymptotes for this function. Lots of problems like this that could be dang near impossible to do without having to do, without having to execute all the algorithms to get roots of polynomials, which nobody ever does. Anymore. You know, it's just we do those on a calculator. I mean, we could do it, but but maybe there's hope here. If we're trying to find holes and vertical asymptotes, we can do some work on this. What work could we do? Maybe equals zero on the problem. Well, I should just see it. Okay, yeah, but how are we going to figure out what are the zeros at the top? Just use your factor it, right? The top is easily factorable. Bottom, not so much, right? Bottoms, if you remember how to factor, you know, polynomials, you no. probably, do you remember the pattern that's no. going to fit that? I mean, technically, like, the x squared is still x minus something plus mm. x squared. No, there, there's a pattern that fits this, but... Yeah. But we won't, I'm not going to take time to review that because it's not that big a deal. It's very seldom to ever do this stuff. But on the top, if we factor that into x minus 2 times x plus 2, well, what are we going to look for first probably? Holes or vertical asymptotes here? Holes. Holes. Because look, we've got the zeros of the top. Let's just check and see if those are zeros of the bottom. And that's easy to do, right? How do we do that? How do I, I, I want to see if either one of those divides into the bottom evenly, right? Wouldn't it be easier to do the whole what thing? How it's called is when you take the coefficients from the Synthetic division? Yeah. yeah. So how about synthetic division? Aha. Uh -huh. Good there, stuff, I right? Do not, I do not see any holes, just those with the asymptotes. Or no, I just see two zeros. There we go. There we go. Okay, so yeah, so let's just let's we'll come back to this solve we'll go forward to that slide. I copied it. If what we're really trying to find is to either one of these things divide into this guy, right? So let's first let's just test x minus two, how about just arbitrarily. So we've got we want to know this. X cubed plus two x squared plus x plus two divided by x minus 2 equals what? Here's where synthetic division really pays off. Now, why can we use synthetic division in this case, but not in other polynomial division cases? Well, that's we can be missing them. We just put zeros in. That's OK. But there's something about this, about the denominator, that makes synthetic division viable, whereas, well, it's because the bottom is linear. Right. If the yeah. bottom were were quadratic or bigger, then synthetic division. Then we have to use polynomial long division, and we'll review that later. We'll get some of that stuff too. Right. But because the bottom is linear, synthetic division is a really easy way to, to execute this. So what do we do? There's our synthetic division bracket. What goes here? The coefficients of the numerator. Right. 
Now, what happens if we're missing a term? What do I have to put? Zero. Got to put zero. I have to put all of the coefficients all the way through the constant. So we've got one, two, one, two, and there's our remainder box. We can set up the whole template before we do anything, right? What number goes out front? Two. How come two, John? Just to set equal to zero. Yeah, good. We're, we're going to input the zero of the denominator, right? So out front goes two. And then what do we do? we got to seed the process by dropping this guy down, right? Multiply by two. Then we always, once a number appears below the bracket, we multiply by the zero. So two times one is two. And subtract. No. Nope. <laughs> No, you, with synthetic division, you do the opposite of what you do with long division. You add. Okay? With long division, you would always subtract, right? So that becomes a 4. Is that right? Hang on a sec. That's right. Yeah, 2 times 4 is 8. It's not going to work, is it? It's not going to work. Because we're, would you agree, we're going to get a number in? Right? Everybody agree? We can stop. We're going to get a number in here, and so that means that x minus 2 is not a factor of this guy. Right? Everybody agree? Okay. But hope is not lost. We can still try the other possibility. Right? So let's just back up a little bit here. Beep, beep, beep. There we go. Okay, I'm just going to do this. Okay. Plus 2 on the bottom. Right? Okay, so now we'll go ahead and redraw this. We got one, two, one, two. What's the number that goes out front this time? Negative two. Negative two. Seat it. Bring down the one. Negative two is zero. Negative two times zero is zero. Plus one is one. One times negative two is negative two. Bingo. It's a factor, right? In fact, this tells us everything we need to know. This tells us that this is equal to what? If I divide this out, what do I get? X squared. X squared plus 0x plus 1, right? And no remainder. So we get x squared plus 1. Well, that's useful to us then because what that really means is that the bottom factors into what? Say it again. This becomes what? X plus 1. X minus 1. X squared no, plus no. 1. No, you, you're trying to factor that. Oh, X squared, oh, X squared plus, plus 1. Times yeah, right, which is what we'd get if I just multiply both sides by X plus 2. Everybody agree? That's just going to cancel out, and I'm going to get that, right? So that goes there, right? X squared plus 1 times X plus 2. Right? Okay, so let's shift gears. Let's go over to here and let's fill those in. So, do we have any holes? We have a hole where? At negative 2. At negative 2. Good. So, we have a hole. Oh, yeah, hole at x equals negative 2. Good. Okay. Uh, are there any vertical asymptotes? Wherever x squared plus 1 equals 0, right? Where, does that make sense? OK, are there any places where that equals 0? Negative 1. No, no, not, no, not, 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 not for real numbers, zero. right? OK, so that begs another review question. How do we know when we have what's called an irreducible quadratic factor? Something that's not going to give us, that's, that's, that's not going to give us any real zeros. OK, how is that going to work? How do we know? There's a couple ways. Well, first of all, we know by this pattern. There is no sum of squares pattern for factoring, and there's a reason for that. Because if I take any positive number, think what happens. If x squared plus a equals 0, where a is positive, what's going to have to happen if I solve for x? Yeah, I'm going to take a square root of a negative, guaranteed. So it blows up. There's no real, right? So anytime you have something like x squared plus a number, guaranteed, that factor cannot give you any real solutions, right? 
doesn't factor, there are no real zeros, right? How else can we tell? I want to remind you about something. This is kind of, this would be sort of algebra 2 slash pre-calc stuff, important stuff. So if we're doing, think about how, if we know for any quadratic in standard form, ax squared plus bx plus c equals zero, what's our famous formula for determining the, the, the zeros of this, real or imaginary? What, what is that? x equals, everybody know it? Oh my gosh. Okay, how much time we got? 10 minutes? Okay. Okay. Excuse me, sir. Uh oh, what happened here? Uh oh. Oh, yeah. Have you seen this one before? Yeah, let's watch it. Oh, we're done. We're done. We're done. We're done. All right, so <laughs> anyway, so now we got the quadratic formula, right? So oh. x, c, equals oh. <laughs> Come on now, hang on, hold, oh, turn over. Plus x equals, come on now, negative b, plus r, negative b, 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 okay, so what's the part of this then, what's the part of this that would cause an answer to be non-real? Where's the danger zone? Under the square root, right? So remember, this is what we call the discriminant. Because that's the part that if it's negative, right? Remember this stuff? Is this making sense? Have you heard that word before, discriminant? You hopefully have yeah, many times. So the discriminant, if the discriminant is negative, we're done. So all we'd ever have to do is just quickly check the value of b squared minus 4ac for any quadratic factor on the bottom. And if we get a negative <coughs> answer, we know that there's no zeros, right? Make sense? All right, that's pretty good. So, that's, say it, Uncle. You got enough for one day? Yeah. Okay. I say, Uncle. How much time we got? We got three minutes. Three minutes? Oh, yeah. Well, that wraps.